Thank you so much for coming. Uh, welcome to this law.gov uh, workshop. Um, before I begin, I'd like to um, thank the people who organized it. Um, Carl Malamud, who I'll be talking about in a moment, uh, the head uh, who's really the, the, the inspiration behind the law.gov initiative um, has, is the person who really uh, approached us and, and made, did all of the driving work and made this possible. Um, Jennifer Jenkins uh, did uh, all of the um, logistical and uh, organizational, also conceptual work of putting together um, the various presentations and steering our, I think, quite biddable speakers uh, into their, their various uh, positions. And Balfour Smith, who's outside, uh, was, as always, indispensable in getting it uh, getting it worked out. Um, uh, a few administrative announcements. Um, uh, Carl Sternley admonished me to tell you that if you wish to tweet or to, or to access the tweets about this, the hashtag is hashtag L-A-W-G-O-V, no uh, period. Um, also, um, we have, the students are in exams right now, and so um, we ask you, um, we will keep the coffee and lunch and so forth um, uh, immediately in here or in the next door room. Um, and so if you're um, after the sessions or at lunchtime, uh, if you could go out into the beautiful sparkling day or, fire, or get down into the Star Commons, uh, the beautiful space out there, rather than congregating right out here because people will be taking exams. So we, we appreciate you, uh, your kindness in that. Um, I was at a conference in um, Stockholm recently uh, where the the organizer introduced me by saying, this is James Boyle, we couldn't get a better speaker. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as a person who writes reference letters for a, um, um, a living, um, which have lots of similar phrases, you will be very lucky to get him to work for you. <laughs> I recommend this candidate utterly without qualifications. <laughs> and he always stood out in the class. Um, being, a, being a, a cognoscenti of such things, it occurred to me that this actually was a somewhat ambiguous uh, commendation. We couldn't get better speakers. But uh, in the positive sense, uh, it is in fact true that um, today we couldn't get better speakers. We really have a remarkable uh, number of speakers here. And, and I want to, um, I, I will introduce the, the people who are going to talk on this panel. Um, and I'd just like to go into slightly more depth than I would normally do, because some of them are uh, uh, our own colleagues, and it's all too easy that we skip over um, the uh, the achievements of those on our own faculty. Um, uh, following me will be Dick Danner. Um, uh, Dick is the person who um, has had uh, all of Duke's Law Journal's online in full for free since 1996, Dick? About then. What? About then. Five? No. <laughs> okay, That's, six. We'll go with six. Well, the fuzziness is in the other direction. <laughs> ah, okay. And um, as, you, as those of you who've studied uh, uh, the history of the web knows, this is almost prehistoric uh, times. Dick is a leader in the library community, in the um, community on open access scholarship uh, more generally, one of the architects of the Durham Statement, uh, which is um, aiming to make uh, law reviews open to the public, um, a very distinguished law librarian and um, fabulous colleague. And he's going to be giving us a background on attempts to open up the law on the uh, the scholarly materials, the surrounding apparatus, and the problems that uh, have been faced there. Um, our own um, uh, David Levy, uh, is uh, our dean, uh, is going to be talking about um, the obstacles and difficulties which would have to be faced in order to fulfill the important challenge of getting legal materials, uh, primary legal materials <coughs> online, serious issues about privacy, uh, about authentication, is this in fact the final version of an opinion, about whether or not unpublished uh, opinions are put up there. Um, all of these, I think, very real problems, and one of the things that um, commended uh, Carl's approach to the law.gov project to us was that um, this is really viewed not as a, uh, we have the answer and now we are going to pound the table and tell you about it, but rather as a, a nationwide exploration of the difficulties in opening up legal materials to the public. Um, but uh, beyond um, David's uh, role as our dean and, and speaking as a former judge, uh, I think it, it may be, uh, it's easy for those of us who are here to uh, sort of forget just the incredible depth uh, of his knowledge, not only somebody who's worked uh, on the rules committees uh, in the American Law Institute as a fellow of the American <coughs> Academy of Arts and Sciences, but really someone who, as a judge, uh, was a thought leader in the judiciary and actually was deeply committed to the idea that the judiciary is important and that it fulfills a vital function and that it can continually do so better. So again, uh, we couldn't have a, a better person to to speak on these issues. And finally, Carl Malamud. Um, Carl, uh, uh, like uh, Justice Dick, was at the 
the, the get-go of getting legal materials online for, full, uh, for free. I, I think the first time I ever saw Carl's name was when he was maybe working with Paul Jones on the original Sun site. This is, uh, again, architectural time in the, in the world of the web. Um, they're putting up the Edgar uh, database, the uh, Securities and Exchange <laughs> Commission database. Um, Carl ha has been described, I think not by himself, but by others, as a rogue archivist, which I, I love. Um, it, it's a sort of it, insurgent librarian is, is there presumably the companion uh, phrase to that in its, its slightly uh, unusual pairing of adjective and noun. Um, but one of the things that has marked all of his work has been a deep commitment to the idea of um, opening public information and public resources to the public, uh, frequently the public that has paid for them, whether it's the patent and trademark <laughs> offices, databases, whether it's the law uh, of the states or of the federal government, uh, or whether it's financial information. And um, uh, the, the idea that sunlight is the best disinfectant and that uh, open markets work best on open information are, I think, ideas that are deeply coded into his DNA. And so he's, um, as the, the head of publicresource.org, as the, 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 the driving force of law.gov, he's um, an ideal person to talk about this initiative. So my job is to set the stage, um, at least conceptually, um, and to introduce um, the ideas that we'll be talking about today, but from a much more um, general uh, and, and uh, sort of broad 50,000 feet level. Um, so I want to start with uh, a story and then turn to a little bit of an analysis of where this project might fit in the larger uh, landscape of American information policy. So the story is this. <clears throat> um, around six or seven, maybe 10 years ago, economists became aware that there was this thing called open source software. Um, and they were puzzled by it because it was produced by people, some of whom weren't being paid to produce it, others were being paid. Those people were producing it and putting it out under a variety of open licenses, which meant that it could be copied freely. In fact, many of these licenses required someone who modified the code and then republished it to put it out under the same license. So an ever-expanding commons of material was made <coughs> out there. It was assembled by a decentralized process, which wasn't obvious. There was no obvious coordination function. There were people, there were nodes, there were structures, but how exactly did it get put together? All of these people somehow came together to form this ecosystem of creativity, deeply committed not just to the idea that people should be able to copy this material, but to the idea that it should be open. Uh, the, the, the phrase frequently used was this notion that uh, the hood of the car should not be welded shut, that you should be able to see what code you were running, whether it was on your voting machine uh, or your laptop uh, or the web server, uh, and indeed open source software powers most of the world's uh, web servers, or your ATM or your TiVo or the plane you're flying, all of these probably are using um, open source software. And the economists were just puzzled because this seemed to them initially to violate all of the rules uh, of production. They couldn't understand how this could be sustained without people attempting to take property rights in the things that they were creating. How could it be that a coder could write and then say, I either renounce ownership altogether or I use my ownership to require future openness. And lawyers, particularly intellectual property lawyers, generally shared their skepticism. They said, we just don't understand how this works. We don't understand how the community is going to work. And we particularly don't understand what the business model is. Like, how are these people going to get paid? How is this going to be sustained as an ongoing idea? One of them, Richard Epstein, said, no commons-based productive system it can survive for more than 10 or 15 years. It's simply not going to happen unless people claim ownership over what they're producing. Then there's simply no way that this community could sustain itself. I was invited to speak on this issue at the American Association of Law Schools, and so I told them that I had been, I too, like them, had been studying a fascinating community community of people who had been producing code for, uh, in this case, you know, an extremely long time. Um, and all of whom produced code in various ways. Some of them wrote it, some of them produced innovations, uh, new types of code um, through their actions, through their works for the particular people they were hired to, to uh, help, who needed particular applications of code, particular iterations. Um, they were generated and they would put it out there into the commons. They never claimed any property rights over it. There was absolutely no claim, this is mine. Um, instead, they relied on either uh, wage labor, they were paid for what they did, um, but then gave away the results, um, or they relied, uh, in some cases they did it uh, as volunteers, uh, out of uh, an idea that this was something that should be done. Um, but it, they actually, it wasn't just that they gave it away, they actually claimed that a fundamental component of the system required that the code be open. The name of these people is lawyers. 
The legal community has been generating code, legal code, for thousands of years. Now, admittedly, they weren't always committed to openness, and perhaps, as we'll hear today, particularly from Jennifer Jenkins, they're not perhaps still committed to openness. But by and large, once we got by the scribal languages, once we got by the restriction of law to a, um, a language known only by a few, once we got by law French, the idea that the code should be open, that it should be accessible, that it should be transparent, became a fundamental notion in the rule of law itself. This actually was a component of what we meant by law. You could not talk about law without implying openness. And it was also remarkable that in a common law system, the people who generated legal arguments, novel legal arguments, the first person to bring a particular kind of class action, the first person to bring a palimony suit, the first person to realize that this could be a new environmental tort or that sexual harassment could be cobbled together out of intentional infliction of emotional distress claims, this person didn't then say, I now own this. Catherine McKinnon didn't say, you can't make a sexual harassment claim without paying me royalties. The first person to make the palimony suit doesn't say, sorry, that one's patented, although sadly recently some people have been suggesting that this is possible. Instead, they said, this is something which is generated by our efforts, which goes out there, which is part of building the legal system. Um, and this is something uh, which should be open to all. Now, I don't want to strain the analogy too much. Obviously, judges and legislatures have different roles than open source software programmers. But I want to suggest to you that the title of the workshop, it, if, if law is American's operating system, should it be open source, is more <coughs> than just a play on words. That there actually is a notion here of exploring the extent to which a requirement of the code itself is openness. That that is actually included within our ideals for it. Um, and secondly, that we should explore and think creatively, as the open source software community did, about ways in which one can not only make this open and public, but which then layers of other activities, some of them for profit and some of them not for profit, could be built on top of a commons of accessible material. That's exactly what happens with open source software. Red Hat, for example, makes a lot of money out of software which is completely not owned by them, right? They build a layer of services on it. Lawyers have always done that. But I think there are also ways in which we could think about the future of legal research services in a much more dynamic way than the current relatively duopolistic system which we have in the United States. Okay, enough of the analogy. Let me turn to our general background. Um, if you study um, uh, intellectual property, or if you study First Amendment law, if you study communications law, you tend to think about your little area as being the only area in which uh, information policy is made. We don't generally think about the information policy of the United States of America. Um, and in fact, if we did do so, it would seem to cross all of those boundaries. It would include things like the First Amendment, it would include things like copyright law, it would include things like the Administrative Procedures Act, and the uh, requirements of due process. Um, uh, all of these things coming together um, in order to sort of frame the way that we think about uh, information policy. And it seems grandiose to talk about the information policy of the United States. But I'd like to suggest that the United States actually has had an information policy, um, not always, not consistently, not in every area. Uh, but it is one which is fundamentally important for the framing of the discussion that we're going to have today. And the interesting thing about the United States information policy, and this makes it particularly uh, exciting for those of us who are interested in empirical explorations of the way things actually play out in the world, is that it is not the information policy that every state has taken. I think actually, it, has, it reflects an approach which is, to some, in some regards, uh, quite unique. So what is that policy? Well, it's made up of many parts, as I said. Let's start with uh, one of the most remarkable. <coughs> Facts are free. This is a really remarkable tenet and is one that is not absorbed or not uh, put out there by um, every state. The United States is committed to the uh, notion, uh, through, largely through its copyright policy, that unoriginal compilations of fact cannot be covered by property rights. <coughs> now, this is actually quite striking. What it says is, you can have property rights, but the property rights are not going to be over the layer of fact and additionally, a second tenet, they're not going to be over the layer of idea. Property rights can exist over things like expression and invention, expression, copyright, invention, patent. But the layers of fact and the layers of idea will remain open as a commons for future people to mine in order to create new expressions <coughs> and inventions. In other words, right from the beginning, the United States uh, copyright system, and arguably I would, I would say its constitution, 
have built in the notion that we have to have, we believe in, some property rights over uh, expression and uh, inventions, but we believe those are built out of a commons, a commons of uh, facts and a commons of ideas. This is a remarkable notion, and it's one that is not shared. Uh, in the EU, for example, unoriginal compilations of fact are covered by database rights. Um, this is not a presumption. And this idea that actually the commons and the property right work together in order to generate things, rather than it's property rights do all the work, is something that I think is one of the most profoundly right things about US policy. I, I think there's empirical evidence uh, comparing the performance of US database industries to those of the EU that our approach also works better. That is to say, economically, it produces more stuff, more access. And it also has considerable First Amendment benefits. Jochai Benkler has written on this very interestingly, uh, talked about the ways in which the requirements of the First Amendment include uh, requirements that effectively make it impossible for us to enjoin access to facts in cases where fundamental uh, political uh, activities are involved. Facts and ideas are free. The second tenet of US um, information policy, uh, one that is, I think, equally remarkable, is that federal government information, at least, goes immediately into the public domain. Now again, this is not a universally held belief around the world. Um, growing up in Britain, for example, uh, I would always see government publications coming out with crown copyright on them. This was, it's owned by the crown. Uh, if you got the ordnance survey maps, um, you would say this is owned by the ordnance survey. And when the ordnance survey found, the ordnance survey being the, the British national map maker, found that compet competitor map makers were actually had the temerity to make maps of British streets, they claimed that they owned the street names. <laughs> now, it's, it's good that we laugh, but what actually, the, the claim like this makes you realize just how different the American approach is. Their idea was, we need to go on making maps. And in order to go on making maps, we need to own the stuff that the maps represent. They, the Ordnance Survey, I think, doesn't believe in Wittgenstein. They believe that the map is the terrain, right? So they, they look out there and they say, we need to own this because otherwise we will not have the control that is necessary, first of all, to make accurate maps and secondly, to pay for our activities. And that's the position they start from. Our existence as a benign public uh, entity depends on ownership and control. This view, sadly, is one that today is taken by American scientific societies in a, a realm outside of, our, um, our, outside of our domain. They finance their worthy activities by publishing absurdly expensive scientific journals, which they then expect noble librarians to pay for. Um, and because they are doing good things, they think that their particular restriction of access through property rights is noble and good, rather than thinking what we do is noble and good, the way we pay for it should perhaps be changed. Uh, a separation that is, I think, vital here. And that's one that I think is also going to be relevant when the law.gov program turns to things like PACER. Uh, PACER has uh, generated income for uh, the United States uh, judiciary to do good things with technology. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the way that income is generated for, to do good things with technology is through requiring people to pay for access to basic government documents. Facts and ideas are free. Government information goes immediately into the public domain. And here I want to stress just how important the second tenet is. Um, there's a very interesting story uh, uh, analysis, actually, that came out of comparing the US and the EU approach to weather data. Um, the US, as you know, as you may know, makes all weather data generated by the federal government available at the cost of reproduction, uh, which if you're getting it online, effectively means whatever you're paying for your web connection for free. But if you want all of US weather data, you can send them uh, a check for a box of DVDs, and they'll burn it for you. And I mean all of it, back to the revolution, right? All of it. I think it's about 1,200 bucks for the history uh, of United States weather data. It might be up as much as 2,000. Um, you can have it all, because we just give it away. And that's a fundamental tenet of our information policy. When researchers wanted to model the monsoon, which, as you know, kills hundreds of thousands of people um, on bad years around the world, uh, particularly in uh, Pakistan, uh, for example, 
um, they thought, well, what we should probably do is get as much weather data as we can and run it through a supercomputer and see if we can mash up these models that see these well-studied areas of weather, particularly over uh, tens, twenties, hundreds of years, to see if, we can, see if we can find patterns which will help to predict what kinds of con predictions produce the monsoon. And as you know, this is the, the, in many ways, people think the future of much of clim climate science is these ever more complicated, more sophisticated computer models. So they came to the United States, to NOAA, very easy. They sent them to... You know, 1,200 bucks, 2,000 bucks, and they get all of the United States weather data. Then they go to the EU, and they find that for the weather history of a single German province, they are quoted the cost of 1.6 million euros. As a result, they ran their models using US data alone. That means that the models are less attractive, less uh, accurate, less useful. That's a cost. In this case, it actually may be a cost in human lives, right, because the model is less attractive. It's certainly a cost to science. You might think, well, if we're doing that, there must be some enormous benefit to locking up the material. And indeed, um, studies done by independent uh, um, economists, econometricians of the European and the US approach have revealed um, that there are benefits. The, U the EU approach is largely to say, this activity must cover its own costs. We are generating uh, weather data. That costs money. We have satellites. We have uh, barometers and so forth, and we need to pay for that. And so the way we'll do this is we'll charge people for access to it. The same with maps, the same with traffic data. Right? So the idea is the government is providing this stuff, and so we're going to make the citizens, basically the people who are using it, pay for it and make people pay for things they buy. We do that in the market all the time. You pay for milk, you pay for bread, right? Why shouldn't you pay for weather data? And there is an economic multiplier to weather data. Weather data, traffic data are extremely useful. They produce, um, those of you who followed the debates over the stimulus package, you know that people will get really excited out of a multiplier of 1.5 or 2 on the spending of every dollar, every dollar spent on digging a new freeway or whatever. If it got up to generating $2 back into the economy, we go, woo-hoo, we've really got it. Well, the EU could be justifiably pleased because um, when you do weather data, you enable an enormous number of efficiency-enhancing activities. For example, people can decide whether to have their building crews standing by or not standing by if it's going to be rained out. No point hiring those people, right? No point renting that equipment. No point going on vacation when it's just going to be rained out. Thousands, millions of decisions in the economy made more efficiently because people have better access to information. This is the ideal, uh, the economist's ideal, is sort of the economic garden of Eden where we have perfect information uh, and no transaction costs, and presumably no serpents either. The EU gets a, an eight-fold multiplier out of every uh, euro spent on um, weather data. And despite the fact that they are charging for it, restricting access for it, not giving people the full feed, not providing this river of data to people, you might say, wow, well, that is amazing. Eight, eight-fold multiplier, that is incredible. The United States gets a 32-fold multiplier. Now, you need to pause and think about this. What is that multiplier? That is for every dollar that we spend on generating this weather data. When they've gone out to study it, when they've looked at all of the range of efficiencies, the, the, forego the costs that were not incurred in building crews standing around waiting, of flights <coughs> not booked to go somewhere where nothing was going on, of farmers not planting their crops at the wrong time and having them then rot in the ground, that generates a vast amount of savings to the economy, vast amounts of dead, lo dead weight loss foregone. But it also generates the kind of um, revenue that we might think of more conventionally. Economists are very happy about that avoidance of dead weight loss, but lots of the rest of us go, yeah, but who's, who's getting paid for this? Is anything actually happening? And of course, the second thing that happens is in the United States, you have a second layer of um, activities built on top of this commons, a commercial and volunteer layer. So if you go to weather.com or AccuWeather or any of these other sites that are commercially available, what they're doing is they're taking all of that weather feed and then they're layering on top their own proprietary algorithms, their own cute little animations, their own, you know, uh, in 17 days the temperature will be exactly 72 degrees, which is completely fallacious but gives you this wonderful feeling of control of your, of your life. And, you know, if it has a cute little icon, how can you possibly doubt it? And we'll support that through our subscriptions, through our advertising clicks and so forth. And then there are other much more specialized services that you probably don't deal with. So there are people who have really fancy algorithms that predict exactly when to plant soybeans, for example. And again, all of this activity, economic activity, is built on this open <coughs> commons layer, this op layer of open material. Facts are free. Government-generated data is free. And free does not mean 
anathematic to commerce or an economic activity. Au contraire, it actually enables it. So those are two fundamental components. But I think there is arguably a third or fourth, which come from the combination of our due process ideas and our First Amendment ideas. These are notions that actually to be a citizen in the polity requires a certain level of freedom to get access to information and to transmit information out there. And that certain kinds of governmental restraints on that are therefore impermissible. Uh, to give one example, uh, Mel Nimmer said that even if um, publishing a uh, copyrighted photo of the My Lai massacre without the photographer's permission were not protected by the fair use doctrine, it would be clearly protected by the First Amendment. If somebody said, you can't do that, I'm getting an injunction, you can't publish this photo because I own it, the First Amendment alone would give you the right to do that. Property rights would have to give way. That's a, uh, a line that we could take up. But more importantly, and this is something that Jennifer Jenkins will be talking about in the uh, second half of our program, that when we come to the notion of access to the law, there is actually a fundamental notion of due process requirement, <coughs> not merely, I would argue, of freedom of ownership, but of actual access itself. Not just, let's not own this, but you actually have to get access to it. As the early cases in the 19th century said, if in ancient Rome they actually posted the laws up on the walls of the city so that you would know them, if we are going to say, we presume that you know the law at your peril, that you are presumed to know what it is, there's actually a concomitant duty coming from the rule of law itself to make citizens, to give citizens effective access to that material. So, if we put these areas together, facts are free, ideas are free, government generated information, at least federal government information, goes immediately into the public domain where we can build upon it in multiple <coughs> ways. And there is both a due process and a First Amendment uh, set of norms which lead us to believe that there's actually an injunction not merely perhaps to withhold property rights, but actually to give effective access. I think we have the framing which makes the discussion of law itself so important. Because law, of course, fits into all of my three areas. You could think of law as a fact or idea. Indeed, in those cases where um, copyright claims have been made over state building codes, the courts um, have deployed the merger doctrine, the idea that this is either a fact or an idea. To know what the law is, the only way of getting to what the law is is what the law is. It's the words of the law. You can't say, oh, that's copyrightable expression. It's the law. Right? You can't own that. The merger doctrine says when there's only one way of expressing an idea or a fact, it can't be copyrightable expression because to do that would be to give you ownership over facts and ideas. And premise number one, facts, of idea, facts or ideas are free. Second theme, government-generated information goes immediately into the public domain. What could be more paradigmatically government-generated information than the law? The law itself is actually the code thrown off by the operating of the state. Right? Uh, our second premise should therefore require access. <laughs> and finally, due process and First Amendment concerns seem to me clearly to mandate not merely an absence of property rights, but effective access. So all three of our norms come together to provide a synthetic reason to give access. However, that's great. I had the easy job. I get to set up the normative high ground, the framing around which the rest of the debate goes on. But now there are the details. The details of actually getting it done, of getting it done in a way that is accurate, in a way that's accessible, in a way that remains there, where the archives will actually survive over a long time, uh, that deals with the privacy concerns, that deals with issues of whether or not these uh, opinions are published or not, that deals with the question of how this material could be integrated into the larger scholarly literature on the law, the law review literature, for example. Those are enormous problems, and those are ones uh, which our subsequent speakers through the rest of the day are going to turn to. So like any good academic, I get to speak first, deal with the, un the, difficult, the, the, the easy abstract problems, and leave the more complicated details uh, to my less lucky um, colleagues. So thank you very much. Um, we can take questions briefly here, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dick Danner to take us on the, the next stage of our journey. Maybe a few questions? Mark. Jamie, there's a, going to your second point about the government not owning copyright, that's true if the government generates the data, but if the government contracts to generate the information, copyright exists. And in my observation, there is an increasing tendency for the government to contract out 
information generation. Yeah. Uh, the Patent and Trademark Office, for example, is even looking so far as to say, we, we can't manage our own IT resources and we're doing a bad job. We're going to contract with Google or IBM to now basically own the patent database and license it back to everybody else to, to access. And, and, and perhaps this is something Carl's prepared to talk about later, but uh, th that's one of the things that we will face is who's generating the information in reality. So this is a, a wonderful point. Um, uh, Mark Webbing, by the way, former uh, general counsel uh, of Red Hat um, and now working with a variety of the initiatives to uh, help re restore our sadly taxed uh, patent system, including peer to patent uh, and so forth, um, and working with the Free Software Law Foundation. Um, it, it's a real problem. I've been involved in a, a number of meetings around this. Carl, I know, has been involved in a lot more. Um, the problem is this. You have uh, you know, a well-meaning government agency faced with dwindling budgets trying to generate information for the public. They have a bunch of people who come in and say, you know, we're really good at this. We're private companies. Um, we can solve your problem. We can lower your costs. And the person um, who's making the deal says, well, okay, well, what, what do I need to do? Okay, well, all I need to do is, like, ensure, I don't know, whatever I'm thinking is my obligation to the public right now, like effective public access to the following scans. And so I write the contract to say, you, the contractor, have to provide effective public access to the following scans, the following satellite photos, the following weather data, whatever. But you then get to own the underlying material. Right, which you have processed or you have, and you get to own more complex services that are put in. You get to be the gatekeeper. So you get to say whether or not someone can take those satellite scans and make Google Maps, uh, Google <coughs> Maps, or whether or not you could integrate the weather data and the satellite data uh, and the geosciences data in order to produce uh, multi-layered maps or whatever. The, the whole, all of the things that we can't yet imagine because they have not yet happened. And so um, one of the things which, uh, and this uh, a group of people, uh, particularly Harlan Onsrud, uh, I think in the, the geosciences community, uh, have been arguing, is that we really need to get worked into the DNA, uh, the notion that certainly the government can use private contractors, but when it does so, one of the things that it has to guarantee is access to the underlying layer of the data generated, that we can't sign away <laughs> the public birthright. Uh, really, I do think there, there's an analogy here to the public trust doctrine from property law, which is we don't just get to turn the canal over to the private ship owner in perpetuity uh, because it act, the public actually has an interest in it. And the thing is that the short-term identification of our interest in access to one particular manifestation of data should not be confused with our long-term interest in access to the data as a whole and the future ways we have not even yet thought about that we will process it. And I know I'm speaking to the, preaching to the choir in that one.